Well, grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for who you are. You are God, the one true living God. You are worthy of all honor and glory and praise. You are worthy. Your Son is worthy. Holy Spirit is worthy. We're gathered here today because you've brought us here into this place. We're gathered to hear your word. We're gathered here to grow as your people, to mature as your children. We pray, Father, now, as I always pray, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each and every one of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, teach us what we need to know, Father. Show us what your word has to say to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we are going to be looking at James chapter 1, verses 9 to 18. You do have a handout for that. You can see in the handout there are four different se- uh, four separate sections. This particular uh, passage from James chapter 1 is or has four different points to be made. Now, I'm going to start with the first two verses, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, and I'm going to read that to you. You can go ahead and read it with me, but I want you to hear it out loud. Hear what James writes. He says, The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wild flower. Do you understand that? Does that make sense? Is it clear? No, huh? Okay, how about this version? That first one was the New International Version. Now, this is the uh, New American Standard Bible, the NASB. Here's what that translation says. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass, he will pass away. Is that any better? No, huh? Okay. Well, now, I had problems myself. I was scratching my head. I was doing a lot of pondering. I was wondering, Lord, what does this mean? Then I checked out the complete Jewish Bible, the CJB. And here is what that translation says. Verses 9 and 10 of James 1. Let the brother in humble circumstances boast about his high position. But let the rich brother boast about his being humbled, since like a wildflower he will pass away. What about that one? Yeah, that one makes a little bit more sense, doesn't it? That's the one that we're going to look at. That's the one that makes sense. I had to do a lot of searching this week. I did have to do a lot of meditating. I did have to do a lot of translating of my, you know, text for myself. And it was through translating the text for myself that I was then able to figure out which of these English translations was closest to the Greek. And so it's very important for us to get as close as we can so that we can understand what James is trying to say. A lot of our translations, what they try to do is they try to make sense of the text, and sometimes that doesn't work at all. And that just confuses us sometimes more. But the complete Jewish Bible right now, an English translation from a Jewish perspective, that's the one that makes sense the most. Isn't it interesting God sees things quite a bit differently than we do, and this text brings that difference to light for us. You see, we tend to envy quite a bit uh, those with wealth while giving little consideration to the poor or those in humble circumstances. Not God. God flips the tables on us in this passage. In God's economy, those with humble circumstances are at a high position. In fact, this text says that they can boast of their high position. They have little earthly wealth. They have little earthly treasures, but they have great faith in God. James writes about this in James 2, verse 5. 
They have great faith in God because they have to rely on someone other than themselves for their lives. And so they lean heavily on God. They have great faith in God. And we know that they will inherit the kingdom because they love God. The rich, however, they can find it a challenge to have great faith in God. And the reason why they can find it a challenge to have great faith in God is because their wealth can blind them to their need for God. Because, you see, they have a tendency to lean on their wealth to hold them up in life rather than leaning on God to hold them up in life. Didn't Jesus say that it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Yes, he did. You see, wealth can be a trap and a snare, and the rich need to understand this and beware. Do they control their wealth, or does their wealth control them? When they do understand how wealth can be a trap and a snare, then it becomes a joy for them when the Lord humbles them. And when the Lord humbles them, he is reminding the rich of their dependence upon him, not on themselves. Now here, we've also got to know that there is a lot of responsibility that goes along with having riches. The acquiring of riches is never for the sake of the one who acquires them alone. It becomes necessary for the rich to seek the Lord, to know what plans the Lord has for the riches. You see, we have this passage in the scripture of the man who was looking at a potentially bumper crop harvest. And he looked at his harvest and he says, my barns cannot hold them all. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to build bigger barns. Tear these old ones down, build bigger barns, and then I'm going to store up all of my crops, and I'm going to sit back, and I'm going to say, eat, drink, and be merry. And I'm not going to have to work. And the Lord said, the Lord called him a fool. And he said, tonight your life is required of you. Then who will gain your wealth and your riches? Does the wealth have us, or do we have the wealth? Do we understand the responsibility that we have with the wealth the Lord has allowed us to accumulate? Wealth means responsibility. So let's listen to that text again. Let the brother in humble circumstances boast about his high position, but let the rich brother boast about his being humbled, since like a wild flower he will pass away. For just as the sun rises with the burning heat and dries up the plant so that its flower falls off and its beauty is destroyed, so too the rich person going about his business will wither away. Probably most of us will say, well, I'm not rich. Well, compared to the rest of the world, yeah, we, are. we really are. Okay? Um, and so we need to understand this. We need to keep our, our, our lives in balance. He says, the rich man is even going to start withering as he goes about his business. Even as he's working his little heart out, he's already withering. That's what James is saying. So, now, that word, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial when he has stood the test. Everything in this is in the singular. So, James isn't saying anything about we, he's saying when each and every one of us stand up under trial and tribulation, when we have stood up under trial, when we have stood the test, when we have persevered, when we have endured, each and every one of us will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Where else in the word, there's only one other place in the word of God that we hear about the crown of life. Do you know where that is? Any ideas? It's in Revelation 2. This is what John writes. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and pro uh, poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Notice from the outside. 
that's suffering from the outside. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. So the enduring that we go through, the testing, the trial, the tribulation we go through, we need to endure until the end, the bitter end. And we will receive from it the crown of life, which eventually we will throw at the feet of Jesus. So, let's go to the next section. The next section is interesting. When tempted, same word, harassment. This time it's tempted, not tried. Okay? When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. Same word. Harassment. Temptation. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Now, let's go back. When tempted, no one should say. That word say is in the imperative. It's a command. Don't say it that God is tempting you. It's a command. All right? No one should say, it's a command, no one should say, God has tempted me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each is tempted when by his own evil desire. See, it's on the inside. It's on the inside. Each, each one, but when each one is tempted, when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Remember, the wages of sin is death. Temptations, they originate within us. It is still the word harassment, or its variations, but as he says here, he's talking about lusts and evil desires. And they all originate in us. Greed originates within us. So does slander. So does maliciousness. So does beha- you know, malicious behavior and all kinds of evil, envy, strife, division. It all originates in the heart. And Jesus says, and then it comes out of the mouth. And that's when it really hurts people. So we are not to shift blame to God. Because he's not to blame. For any of this, we are. We are. The last section, everything. And then, in, 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 well, actually, the, the passage, don't be deceived, my dear brothers, goes up with that first, that third section. We are deceiving ourselves if we think it's not us, but God bringing us into temptation. He doesn't do that. Now, he's going to say, why doesn't he do it? He says, because every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. Everything good. Temptations are not good. Okay? Right? That makes sense. Everything that is good, that is given, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Lights, of course, have variations and shifting shadows. I mean, we watch the shadows move every day. But God himself does not change. He does not shift. He doesn't vary. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Every perfect gift, everything good comes from him. Not only this, verse 18 says, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we can be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. It cost God plenty so that we could be the first fruits from his creation to understand his amazing love. And what it would cost him in order to reconcile us back to God. Since he was willing to go so far for us, do you think he's going to tempt us to sin? His son took upon himself all of the sins of the world. He died under the weight of that. God is not going to add to it. If we think otherwise, we're deceiving ourselves. 
It's kind of an interesting passage to go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing. I mean, James doesn't say, a, he doesn't use a whole lot of words, but he sure says a whole lot when he says what he says. Some of it does have to be deciphered, but you know, I spent a lot of time pondering these texts, these passages this week. I did a lot of head scratching actually going, what? Maybe I shouldn't tell you that. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't ever reveal the fact that pastors wrestle with a text and go, what in the world is God saying here? But we do, okay? I mean, how can we preach it if it's not preached to us first? That's, it's got to go to us first. And I have to admit, I mean, I was just like baffled and scratching my head and, and, it, and going, God, please, let Holy Spirit tell me what this means. And he did. I mean, it may not be super clear at this point, but I hope it's clearer than it was from the start. I hope, I hope. This is meat and potatoes, okay? James does not write milk. He's not giving us pablum. He is not putting the food in the grinder and pureeing it. It is stuff to chew on. So, I would say chew on it. Go over it. Again and again and again. And ask Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what does God want me to get out of this? Amen.